begin to develop a middle class, as we've talked about, uh, we begin to see a consumer culture. Uh, of course, in the old days, you made everything yourself there on the farm or virtually everything. But as people move into the cities and they're unable to do that, and they begin to have incomes, and they begin to have disposable incomes, they're going to begin to consume. Incomes do go up for most people, but not evenly. Remember, the rich are getting much, much richer, while the poor really aren't doing uh, all that much better at all. Clerks, accountants, middle-level management, and other white-collar workers uh, will increase by a third uh, between 1890 and 1910. Doctors, uh, their incomes will increase by a third, I should say. Doctors, lawyers, and other professional, uh, professions do even better. The working class, of course, rose slower. Iron and steel workers start at a lower point, but they do keep pace in terms of the percentage of growth of their incomes. Female-dominated industries like shoes and textiles and paper do worse, and of course, minority groups do worse as well. Asians and blacks and, and Hispanics do worse. But rising income creates new markets for mass-produced and heavily marketed consumer goods. Uh, one great example is what we see here on the left, which is ready-made clothing. Of course, before this, people either made their own clothes at home or they hired a tailor to custom-make clothes for them. But now we're going to begin sized clothing. So you can make, uh, you know, 100,000 shirts that are identical but in different sizes, and people can just go to the store and buy them. We take that for granted, but that was a big innovation. The Civil War, and this actually comes out of the Civil War. The Civil War, of course, created a huge demand for uniforms. And after the war, the, the, the companies that had set up factories to make uniforms wanted to continue to make money. And they had, they had kind of really perfected this sizing system for Civil War uniforms, and now they're going to turn it to clothing. Uh, this, of course, also made possible by the invention of the sewing machine. And it created the fashion industry, uh, which is going to be one of the first really big mass marketing industries. Canning, which is developed in the 1880s of food, creates a market for things like canned food and condensed milk, which were new and pretty exciting at the time. We don't think of them as exciting today. Another great innovation that comes along right around the turn of the century is the refrigerated railroad car. What this meant is that foods could stay fresh a lot longer. And so uh, fruits and vegetables and meats that are harvested far away from your city can be kept cold as they're brought to your city. And it greatly expands the variety of food that we can eat. Artificially frozen ice will be developed and will lead to the ice box. That's what these things up here are. Now, these aren't electric. You don't plug these into the wall. Uh, there's actually a cabinet where you put a big block of ice, and there's a guy called the Ice Man who comes around and delivers this on a regular basis. Now, this, so what this means is you can now store this food that's being shipped to your community. Um, you can store it in your own home at a colder temperature and keep it fresh longer. And the variety of the American diet greatly expands, particularly if you have any money at all. We're also going to see the first chain stores. Um, uh, th this is a, a store with multiple locations. And of course, some of these will spread all across the country. Uh, the Atlanta and, and the Pacific Tea Company, or A and P, is the first nationwide grocery store, one with locations all over the country, in the 1870s. And you see some pictures of it there. Woolworth sells dry goods, uh, which are not groceries. It would be kind of like a Walgreens, maybe, uh, today. Um, and they also become a nationwide chain that everybody in America would recognize. Sears and Roebuck takes a different approach. They're a mail order company, so they mail out a catalog and you can choose things out of the catalog and order them. Now, if you live away from a city, if you live in the country, the Sears and Roebuck catalog was a huge deal. That's kind of your link to the world. In fact, I'm not that old, but I can remember as a kid going through the Sears catalog and picking out Christmas presents. Um, and of course, Sears later would open up uh, real stores. Marshall Field in Chicago pioneers the idea of a department store, like you might see in a shopping mall today. But that was a major innovation. Of course, these appear in other cities, most famously probably Macy's and Bloomingdale's in New York City. But they're in, all, they're in every city in America. Here's a page from the Sears and Roebuck mail order catalog. Um, and this would, might be the thing that you would get and look through and decide what things to buy. But buying thing is what it's all about. Women fashion changed faster and was demanded more. Women bought and prepared the food. Uh, and, and women also, by the way, worked as the sales clerks usually or the waitresses in the restaurants. And so women are the primary consumers. The guys aren't working, the women are shopping. I know it's a stereotype, but it was true. Florence Kelly founds the National Consumer League in the 1890s, and these are actually women who are concerned with the conditions the products they're buying are being made in. 
and they demand fair working conditions for the pro uh, products. And they actually investigate how things are being made. And if it's being made in, under good fair working conditions, they'll approve a, a, a National Consumer League label to be put on it. So consumers can know, oh, this isn't being made in a sweatshop. This isn't being made by children or something like that. Very similar to the arguments we're having today, um, uh, where we, a lot of people in America want to know that the products are being made or made under ethical conditions.